Um, yeah, my name is Matt Fry from uh, UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. I'm hosting this as the third um, webinar in our um, series around AI environmental science, which is supported by NERC and the Constructing a Digital Environment program, um, which is a program aiming to develop the digitally enabled environment, benefiting researchers, policymakers, businesses, communities, and individuals alike. Um, and the, this program has been running since uh, 2019, I think, with, with the aim of envisaging and developing approaches to creating the future digital environment, sort of exploiting advances in technology and increasingly diverse data sets to improve our understanding and management of the environment. And it's been doing this through a number of funded projects and a range of other activities, um, also through building a community in the area of digital environments and um, despite the pandemic. Um, building that through an expert network, running of events and a, and a successful conference uh, last year. Um, and it's on that note, it's great uh, pleasure to be able to inch, announce that uh, the NERC um, Digital Gathering 2023 conference is now open for registrations and for submission of abstracts. So the full details are linked from the, the homepage, um, which has just been posted in the chat. Um, the event is free to attend um, and it takes place from July the 10th to the 11th at the British Antarctic Survey offices in Cambridge. So uh, yeah, feel free to sign up, book your place now, or or look at the the range of um, themes being addressed and submit an abstract to describe some of the work you've been doing. Last year's one was fantastic um, opportunity. I don't know if it was just because the first thing I'd done since the pandemic, um, but it was really great opportunity to get together and talk to people in person about uh, these areas of yeah digital technologies and the environment. So yeah, back to this seminar series. Um, this is, this is saying this uh, the seventh of these webinars that the, the Constructing a Digital Environment program has run. There's been a fantastic range of subjects across the series from environmental sensors, data management, legal and ethical aspects of a digital environment and decision making, as well as our seminars showcasing some of the projects within the program. Um, and this series is around AI and environmental science, considering the role and opportunity, as well as some of the pitfalls in the use of AI and environmental science. Um, so the format of the webinar is to, to have a presentation from leading experts in the field, followed by a chance for, for, for Q&A afterwards. They're also recorded and we get a lot of um, views after, after the event. So I strongly recommend you catching up with previous recordings and signing up to the YouTube channel, which again, I think has just been posted in the chat. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, I'm very excited today to say that the presentations um, from um, Peter Battaglia from Google DeepMind talking about his Graphcast learning skillful medium range global weather forecasting. Um, Peter's a research scientist and director at Google DeepMind. Uh, his work focuses on approaches for modeling and reasoning about complex systems by combining richly structured knowledge with flexible learning algorithms. So in this webinar, Peter's gonna present his recent work on Graphcast, a new machine learning based weather simulator, um, talking about how the results from this system represent a key step forward in complementing and improving weather modeling with machine learning and opening new opportunities for fast and accurate forecasting. Um, so on, feel free to post any questions. We'll have around 40 minutes to talk um, and then followed by quick Q&A. So post any questions in, in the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom rather than the chat. And we'll field those at the end to collate these and put them to Peter. Um, and just confirm we're recording this. And with that, I'll hand over to, over to you, Peter. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. Right. So um, <clears throat> thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to kind of talk to you guys today. Um, and I, I think just to start off, I, I do have, I, I have, to, I should have time in my talk to um, take some small clarification questions as we proceed. Um, I'm not sure if the format of this is going to uh, allow that, but like you, if, if I can be interrupted by the moderators, feel free for small questions. Um, and I can just usher us along if I think that, um, you know, it's going to drag out too long and we're going to need to move on to the, the rest of the content. Um, and the other thing I just want to start by emphasizing and sharing is that um, the, the, the work that I'm going to present today is by, uh, I'm presenting on behalf of my team, um, <clears throat> but we have, a, I guess, I don't even know how many people, quite a few people that have uh, contributed in various uh, ways to this. Um, and most of us don't have much training in weather or atmospheric physics uh, or a lot of this sort of uh, the topics that we're going to cover today. 
Um, and we've been you know, sort of learning this as we go. Um, and so if I use sort of non-standard lingo or say things that kind of make you raise your eyebrows, um, feel free to educate me and <laughs> um, this is how we learn. So cool. All right, so let me get into it. So I started, uh, I just put at, at the very beginning a sort of uh, too long, didn't read slides. So uh, this is a kind of, hopefully should capture most of the setup for the talk and what we're doing. So the goal of the work that I'm going to present is to uh, use machine learning to learn global medium range weather forecasting. Um, and the motivation is that current uh, numerical weather prediction, NWP, uh, is uh, complex. It relies on sort of complex and expensive hard-coded simulators. And our goal is to learn more accurate and more efficient methods uh, by exploiting available historical data. And some of these videos, uh, these sort of you know, animated GIFs videos that you're seeing are just examples of some of the, um, the fields that we're modeling. So that in total, we have 20, 227 weather layers across um, lots of vertical levels. Um, but these are three examples. So you have wind on the surface, surface temperature, and then temperature uh, at 500 hectopascals. Um, and the purpose, the reason we're doing this, um, hopefully downstream, and then what we think this work can contribute to is uh, along with the kind of the rest of the uh, body of work that's coming out of machine learning literature right now and weather forecasting is to provide faster and better day-to-day -day weather predictions for everyone uh, and to hopefully improve prediction and planning for natural disasters and extreme events that are sort of disproportionately um, uh, uh, impactful and important for, for human activity. Okay, so that's sort of like the top level and then I'll kind of uh, actually go through the, the, the talk. Um, so the hope is that what you'll take away today is uh, four basic things. Uh, my argument for what the motivation for using machine learning to model weather is, uh, an overview of how our machine learning based GraphCast model works, uh, how GraphCast forecasts compare to the top operational uh, and ML based systems, and then some limitations and next steps that we think we can take. So starting with the motivation. Um, so I want to start by emphasizing NWP is really a major success story in science and engineering. Uh, there's been decades of research that have uh, culminated and led us to this point where we have these extremely detailed and faithful models of weather. Um, by numerically solving these uh, model equations on supercomputers, we can get extremely accurate forecasts and predictions of what's going to happen out you know, many days, like days, even weeks in advance. Uh, NWP scales really well with compute resources. So the higher the resolution you uh, allocate, the better your solutions are going to be. And um, it also NWP also scales well with better current observations. So if you have more accurate observations and then you do your data assimilation and you uh, get good initial conditions, this is going to lead to more accurate forecasts and solutions. So uh, what's the downside? So one problem is that traditional NWP methods and, uh, and, and, and the, the models and the solution methods uh, are very costly to innovate. Uh, it takes experts with significant training um, to manually design and update these equations, um, come up with better, more accurate, more efficient solution, you know, solvers, numerical solvers. Uh, so that's one problem. And another problem is that traditional NWP, it while it scales as I said, you can get better forecasts by having better inputs. You can't actually improve your forecast model based on historical observations. So in general, just because you have really good observations in big data archives uh, from the past, doesn't really translate that naturally into more accurate forecasts for the future. So it seems like we're sort of leaving things on the table. We've got all this sort of data and observation about weather, but how do we turn that into better forecasts. So ML-based weather prediction has potential to learn solvers directly from data, which can be more accurate and less costly to develop than traditional NWP. Uh, and they have the potential to also be more efficient by learning solution functions at coarser time and space resolutions, but which are still accurate. So the idea here, it's sort of like, you can imagine effective level descriptions of weather phenomena rather than extremely high resolution, fine grained um, vascularizations, you're learning the uh, sort of updates at a coarser granularity. One really kind of rough example I think of this is like, you know, when, when I open my eyes and I look at a tropical cyclone, uh, you know, like a, a sort of a video of a tropical cyclone moving across the a globe, 
I sort of can like see, I can anticipate where it's going to go uh, forward in time. Now I'm not perfect, but I kind of have an idea. It's going to kind of carry forward as if it's like almost an object with some momentum. Um, but that's just not how traditional N NWP models cyclones. And so it, it sort of, I've just used this example to raise the point that there might be kind of other ways to model cyclones or other weather phenomena than taking these, um, you know, Navi Stokes equations with parameterizations and then running them on supercomputers. Um, but what I'll be explaining today is going to be a lot closer to the sort of traditional uh, NWP anyway. The, uh, so it's, it's not like we're actually, you know, going that far where we're kind of thinking about the cyclones at, you know, hundreds of kilometers across and things like that. Okay, so that's the motivation. So um, one other piece of background, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar and probably know more than me about this, but um, what we're using as our, what we're treating as our sort of baseline or the key thing that we're aiming to uh, uh, target is uh, the is ECNWF's HRES forecast, which is their deterministic forecast within their IFS system, um, integrated forecast system. Um, and it's considered by many, sort of arguably probably, but considered by many to be the most accurate uh, operational global medium range forecast in the world. Uh, and the way that HRES is, the, the representation as a reminder for HRES, so it operates um, on a, approximately a, a 0.1 degree latitude longitude resolution with one surface level with hundreds of fields, although many of these are diagnostic fields. Um, and it, you can either get it in 20, at 25 vertical pressure levels with 11 fields or 30, 137 vertical model levels with um, 16 fields. Um, there's, there's just a transform between my, as I understand. And HRES produced uh, four times daily forecasts. Uh, two of those daily forecasts are 10 day forecasts initialized at, uh, at uh, zero and 12 Zulu. And uh, then there's two other forecasts initialized at six and 18 that are three 3.75 days. Okay, so this is just a sort of background on HRES and what, what we're sort of targeting as, as, uh, with our methods. So the scientific goal, I, I sort of summarized this at the top, but scientific goal is to outperform ECNWF's HRES. Um, and what we mean by this is globally, and we're gonna, we're gonna do this at quarter degree resolution rather than 0.1 uh, degree resolution, which I can explain why later, but basically just because the data that we're gonna train on is, uh, is at quarter degree. Uh, we're going to choose four surface variables and then five atmospheric variables at each of 37 vertical pressure levels. Um, and we feel that this is a pretty uh, a pretty com comprehensive and um, uh, complete representation of the state of the weather, uh, with the exception of precipitation. Now, I don't, I won't talk much about precipitation. We do actually model precipitation, but we don't, we actually didn't even bother evaluating because we just don't really trust the precipitation um, data from uh, from RFI reanalysis and, and HRESs. So we just sort of didn't really bother with this, and, and with our thinking about this as a separate thing. But the variables that we do model are temperature of the surface, uh, wind of the surface, sea level, mean sea level, sea level pressure, mean sea level pressure, uh, and then the atmospheric variables are temperature, wind, geopotential, uh, and specific humidity. So that's the sort of spatial representation and the content, the variables, and we also are uh, modeling the forecast at ten days at six hour increments, initialized daily at uh, at four at four times. So you can just think about uh, the forecast as like if this if the, the diagram here shows if it's initialized at uh, 1800 Zulu, then um, you know you take your six hour step and then kind of keep iterating that forward for, uh, uh, until you get to 240 hours at six hour increments. Okay, so that's that's it. That's the that's the goal. Um, and I'll talk about how we're going to evaluate like what what the verification um, is a, a little bit later. <clears throat> so here's how our model works. Uh, so as background, there's been a lot of progress recently in learning simulation with ML. So some of the work that my group has done um, it, uh, based using uh, what are called graph neural networks, which, which are a uh, category of uh, deep learning architectures which can operate on graph or mesh-based representations. Um, what we've shown is that you can learn to simulate very complex fluids, like on the left, like particle-based fluid systems. We've also on the right shown we can model complex mesh, like cloth, uh, uh, cloth dynamics, um, incompressible and compressible fluids. Um, so we think that these graph neural network based learned simulators are a very appropriate and powerful sort of generic technique for modeling very complex physical dynamics. Um, back before we started working on the weather, this weather stuff, we had mostly been training and testing these types of machine learning models 
uh, using increasingly sophisticated and um, detailed simulated data. And we hadn't really tried to train these types of models on real data from real observations. So the weather work we're doing here is one of the first um, examples where we're really putting these models to the test in, um, in situations where the data was not, the, the models are not trained on simulated data, but on real data. Um, and I should also point out that recently there's been a lot of excitement and um, advances in machine learning based weather forecasting. Um, and what we, we had been seeing uh, when we started this project last year is that they were be, be starting to become competitive with uh, IFS at one and even quarter degree resolution for a, usually just like a handful of variables and usually maybe shorter lead times like five or seven days. Um, some of these were based on convolutional neural networks. Um, there's some based by uh, some of the NVIDIA uh, folks on uh, Fourier neural operators, this forecast net. Um, and we also started to see, this is sort of, I guess, like kind of along the way as we were building our, do, you know, doing our work, we also started to see other papers we're using graph neural networks by Ryan Keisler that was very similar to some of the stuff actually from the work that we did in the top right there with the plots. Um, and also transformers, which are a very closely related uh, architecture to graph neural networks. Um, we, we've seen in the past few months some um, nice, nice work come out there too. So machine learning based weather forecasting, I think we're starting to see the graph neural networks and transformers seem to be uh, probably the, the dominant and most powerful architecture right now in this space. <clears throat> So as uh, experts on and, and some, some of the innovators of GNN-based simulators, uh, my group, we went to our sort of trusty graph neural network based uh, simulator and then uh, started to see if we could apply this to the problem of weather forecasting. So here's, here's what graph, here's what we built, and here's what graphcast is. So it's, it, the graphcast is what is the name of our model and it's a, it's a learned graph neural network based weather simulator. And the way it works is it takes an input weather state um, it's represented, it's sort of depicted with this image where you've sort of got the globe and then this little shell around the globe is meant to indicate the latitude longitude grid, but also it's a shell so it's extending out vertically into the atmosphere to represent variables uh, everywhere on the surface and vertically into the atmosphere. And then you see this little sort of blow up here uh, where it's, it's got these yellow, these yellow boxes represent the surface variables and the blue variables. And if you look closely, you kind of squint your eyes and look closely, you'll see they sort of repeat the little color pattern they're meant to represent like the atmospheric variables that are at each of the vertical levels. Um, so that's the input state. So uh, it has, it's because it's a quarter degree resolution, it's roughly a million points on the globe. There's 37 vertical levels and um, the, with the surface and atmospheric variables, as I mentioned before, there's 227 variables um, uh, per, per location on the globe. Graphcast takes that input and just like a normal NWP system, it predicts the next state. Um, and then you apply that iteratively and roll out a forecast. So you just apply this 40 times for your six hour increment, 10 day forecast. And then that gives you a forecast every six hours. Um, and that's it, that's how it works. So the within the way that Graphcast is implemented and what's inside the model is really three components. So there's an encoder which maps the inputs from the latitude longitude grid up to what we call this multi-mesh internal representation, which I'll um, kind of expand on in a second. The, the way you can think about this multi-mesh is it has both high local resolution and long range connections. So you can capture, you can capture interactions among weather phenomena at longer ranges and larger scales if you, the, the model could if it, if it wanted to, um, but it also can model sort of high resolution detail. Once it's encoded into this multi-mesh representation, which is this sort of blue, it's, it's very hard to see because you're sort of like overlaying all of these different meshes on top of one another, which I'll show in a second. Um, to update a point, you in the, uh, as, so it's, it's, uh, the, the input weather is represented in this multi-mesh that sort of surrounds, you know, a, a, with, with a, a spatial kind of spherical spatial representation. And then to update locations uh, the representation of the weather at some point in space, it's informed by the weather at both locally and far away. So these big, long, thick arrows are meant to show that the conditions far away can also inform the state of the weather locally. Um, and again, this is like how a NWP works because if you have like a finite element method or some kind of discretized um, solver, you know, so, so solver op operating on discretized representation, what it's doing is it's basically communicating information in local spatial neighborhoods um, to inform what's going on at a particular point. Um, and we run this 
multi, this processor six, uh, 16 times. We apply this iteratively 16 times. You can kind of think about these as like sub steps within a solver. And then it built the final multi mesh representation of the weather location is then decoded. So then it's it, it's basically projected back down into the latitude longitude grid, um, and it's it, it predicts the basically the change in the weather at that point um, as compared to the input. And this multi mesh representation, um, the way you can think about it is it's so what we've done is we've basically taken an icosahedral mesh, this very coarse, that's this M zero. And then we refine it iteratively six times. So that means we basically take each triangle and then we split the edges of the triangle in half and we put a new mesh point at that midway point and then connect up all those new midpoint, midway points. And you can just see as you kind of proceed from left to right, you get an increasingly high resolution mesh. And then we sort of take the union of all of those nodes and edges. So they just sort of overlay on one on top of the other. So you can kind of think about like those original M0 nodes as like hub nodes that are connected to very far stuff and to their local neighbors, while as the, the nodes that are introduced in later refinement steps are only connected to the neighbors at their own refinement level and further refinement levels. Um, and this gives rise to a, uh, from, from, it goes from the million uh, vertex input grid. Now we have 40,000, 41,000 um, points. We've kind of reduced the resolution in a way and added lots of edges. And um, uh, and and also allowed for this, you know, the points in the grid to talk to things that are much farther away. Okay. Great. So that's the architecture of the model. I haven't told you how it's trained. So this is a neural network. It's going to have some parameters, like this graph cast box up here. It has some parameters that we're going to train using standard deep learning techniques. Um, and here's how that works. So the training data set was based on ECMWF's ERA-5 reanalysis archive, which was 40 years of historical global weather data on Earth. Um, it's actually hourly increments. We only use six-hour increments. Um, and <clears throat> it has the reason that we chose 37 pressure levels for graph cast is because the era five has 37 pressure levels. Um, the training objective was to minimize the mean squared error between graph cast predictions and era five targets. And the this, so this is what graph cast parameter, graph cast is optimized to do is optimized to predict era five targets. So we say we give it an era five input at time not, and then you need to predict at the next time step six hours ahead. And we weighted the loss, so it, because it makes the predictions of all of, of basically 227 variables, we weighted the loss in a way that favored variables that are closer to the surface. So you can just see on this plot here, the x-axis is the pressure level, where as you move rightwards, you move toward the surface of the Earth. And you can see that the loss that's applied is higher, meaning we penalize the model for getting, making errors closer to the surface more than further from the surface. And part of the motivation for this was just that the density is also higher. So there's sort of like more happening. Um, and uh, and yeah, that's, that's, that's basically the motivation. Um, and then the final thing about training, uh, the error gradients are, this is sort of just very standard deep learning. This is like every neural network that you hear about is, is trained like this basically. So you, you back propagate error gradients. So you compute the error between graph cast predictions and the error five targets. And then the, that error, you compute the gradient of that error with respect to the model parameters. And then you move the model parameters around in order to try to get the error to go a little lower. So you do this like over and over and over again. And um, that iteratively sort of optimize the parameters so that at some point graph cast predictions start to look a lot like what's it's going to start very accurately predicting error five. Um, and instead of just training the model to make a one-step prediction, we actually trained it to make 12, a, a sequence of 12 predictions. So what we do is we make it, we, we have the model generate a sequence of, of like a 12 step forecast, which amounts to about three days. And then we take all the, the error, all the error from on every step, compute the gradient of that with respect to the parameters and then update. So the idea is to try to encourage the model to be better at making long range predictions. And we, the way we train it, this is a kind of detail, but I just thought I'd throw it in in case you're curious. Um, we, there's sort of three training phases. At first we kind of ramp up the, the um, uh, the learning rate, meaning like how much loss we're applying in total and how much we're uh, moving the parameters around. Then we have this cosine uh, decay pattern, which is orange, which is the um, uh, over time we sort of make the model as the model kind of starts to converge to to a good to a good uh, uh, you know to an accurate prediction. We 
start to um, taper off the loss that's applied. And then the purple, which I've also plotted in the same axis, shows that at the end, in the last like 10,000 training iterations, we actually, this is the, so up until now, we've only been training on one step. And then at the very end of training, we start training on two steps, three steps, four steps, five steps, six steps, up to that 12 that I mentioned. Um, and so there's a curriculum and we, we, it's, it's very expensive to train these models. So we start by training them on just one step, which is cheaper. And then the 12 steps is just at the end. Okay, um, there's a few other things I should tell you too, just, uh, especially probably for this community who probably will, um, hopefully will appreciate this. <laughs> um, so we were very, we were very, very, very careful about how we um, held apart our uh, evaluation set from our training and our development phase. So what we use what we call this causal data split. So our test data uh, was from 2018 um, and actually going, uh, in later years, we've been testing now, although I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, we never looked at that data from 2018 um, while we were building the model. We were building the model, we were training the model. We went through lots and lots of rounds of research steps. We were changing the model and figuring out different tricks and you know techniques and things like this and seeing how it worked. We never looked at the 2018 data. Um, we were trying to hold out that 2018 data so that we could um, uh, evaluate on it with but, but, and, and know for 100% with 100% certainty that there was no way that anything that was happening in, that, in the evaluation set could have informed our choices about uh, how to build the model. So we call the beginning part the development phase. And this is just represented here. The idea is the blue is all the data from era five that we used to train the model and then validate is we held out 2016, 2017 as validation. This is where we, were, we, were, we kept like training the model, making change to the architecture, changing the model, making change to the architecture, and then about evaluating and verifying it on um, 2016, 2017 to decide what was the best architecture and technique for training this thing. And once we were happy with that, we froze this protocol and we didn't make any more changes to the model or, the, or anything else, the type parameters or architecture, anything like this. And then we retrained the model with data up to 2018 and then we tested on 2018. So the idea here is that all the results that I'll show you in 2018 on, there's no way they could have been informed by um, any of the data, like, like the model couldn't have been sort of meta optimized or kind of, we couldn't have been sort of, you know, ha like hacking it to, to try to make it do well in the test set. And, um, okay. I should also say at this point, this is also sort of what one would do in a normal deployment scenario where um, you actually don't see the future because if you're trying to build a model that's good for the future, well, the future hasn't happened yet. So we tried to also kind of be consistent with that. Um, and training GraphCast takes about three weeks. Um, on 32 cloud TPU v4 devices, which are very powerful deep learning hardware. Um, and once trained, generating a 10-day forecast of GraphCast takes only one minute on one uh, cloud TPU v4 device. By comparison, ECMWF's HRES takes about an hour on their um, 11,000 core HPC cluster, although our, you know, this is it's higher resolution. It's at 0.1 degree instead of 0.4 quarter degree. It's um, uh, it's got more model levels than uh, we have pressure levels. Um, so it's not really a direct comparison, but it's just, it's a sort of point I just wanted to note. I see in the Q&A question, did you consider constant parameters for each grid? Hmm, I'm not really sure what that means. Um, feel free, if you want to clarify that, I'm not quite sure you mean, we have only one input grid. Um, I'm not really sure which parameters you're referring to, but um, feel free to just clarify and I'll try to answer. Cool. Okay. So then that's the training. And then here's what we get. So here's on the top, you see some forecasts videos from HRES. And that's again, the surface wind, surface temperature and temperature at 500 hectopascals. Um, and the bottom is graph cast forecasts of colored uh, videos. It, and this is just, I just put this here to show that like the forecasts look like forecasts. You can see like in the middle column, you can see the graph casts forecasts are showing the diurnal cycle where the temperature of the surface is changing where uh, is changing as the um, you know Earth changes its orientation with respect to the sun, and uh, the the rows that say error are showing the error of HRES with respect to its ground truth and the error of GraphCast with respect to its ground truth, which I'll explain in a second. Um, but you can, if you look really closely, what you'll actually notice is GraphCast error is actually, if you if you you know kind of <laughs> spatially integrate with your eyes, you'll see that it's actually slightly lower. Um, then HRES, and I'll get into that in a second. But the idea here is that the forecast from GraphCast look pretty look pretty good, um, and the error is is comparable or actually a little lower than HRES. Okay, so 
I just that was sort of the output after we trained. And let me tell you how we evaluate because we had to make some um, key choices that are that are important to understand. So first, GraphCast and HRES use different initial conditions. HRES uses its own input analysis. GraphCast uses the ERA-5 as input. Um, it was trained on that, so it's optimized to take ERA-5 and map to ERA-5. Now, ERA-5 uh, is, is a reanalysis data set. The, the NWP that was used for that was actually the HRES uh, version from that was in operation for most of 2016. But since 2016, uh, HRES has been upgraded, and that previous, um, I think it's HRES cycle, I want to say 42R1, but it's in the paper. But basically, um, the HRES, uh, HRES has been sort of upgraded and improved. I um, mean, we're testing in 2018. So we didn't want to, it wouldn't really be fair to use ERA-5 as ground truth for HRES because um, HRES is not trying to predict ERA-5. It's trying to predict, ideally, its own analysis, um, input analysis. Uh, and if we used ERA-5 as ground truth for HRES, that would mean that HRES's error at zero time steps would be not zero. So that doesn't make sense. You wouldn't want to have a model that can't even predict its own input. So and to be more fair to HRES, we basically use, uh, for HRES, we use as ground truth, uh, what we call this HRES FC0, which is basically its input analysis and that we've downsampled to quarter degree resolution. Um, and I'll describe how that works now. So if you think about HRES as a, as a forecast that's, that's being initialized with this, so this orange represents like data assimilation, some observations are being assimilated and generate an input to HRES. And then HRES roll out, rolls out a forecast, that's the blue. Um, and you know, at each six hours, we pick that state, that's the blue boxes. Then six hours later, there's another data assimilation process. That data, that input is given to HRES, and then HRES rolls out another forecast, and so on. What we do is we basically compare, we, we take these red inputs to HRES and we say that that's HRES's ground truth. And now if we want to compare HRES's performance at 12 hours, we compare it to the assimilation. Um, at, at that step, uh, the corresponding step. Okay, so that's HRES FC0 is the red box. So that's just to show we take the inputs to HRES, treat that as its ground truth, we have a future inputs to HRES, and that's its ground truth. One other really important thing that we, uh, this is not in the archive paper, we've actually updated this um, in, a, in a journal submission we've done, but I wanna, um, this is the results we're gonna present because we feel this is a, a better control. Um, ERA-5 data assimilation window is only is 12 hours long. It's, it's done twice daily at 12 hour windows from uh, 21 to, to nine and nine to 21. HRES has four daily assimilation windows, which are only six hours long. Uh, and these are the intervals. What this means is that ERA-5's zero and 12 initializations incorporate info, information from nine hours ahead while HRES's only incorporates information from three hours ahead. So what we decided to do is and this again, this is different from the archive paper. Um, we, we decided to only evaluate on the six and 18 hour initializations because this would mean, so just in the schematic here, you can kind of see like the, the red is the look ahead from each of the initializations. The six and 18 initializations for ERA-5 in the top row and HRES in the bottom row both have the same like look ahead. So we felt this was actually the most fair way to compare these by only using those initializations. If we use HRES, I'm oh, sorry, ERA-5 initialized at zero or 12, it would mean that we're sort of giving the model information that was informed by nine hours into the future, while HRESs would only be informed by three hours in the future. Similarly, um, oh, I should say though, the only problem is that HRES, forecasts of HRES at six and 18 uh, are only 3.75 uh, days long. So you'll see in the results that I'm, that I'm about to show that we use that for the four days forward, we actually do end up going back to HRES's zero and 12 initializations. Um, this is still very conservative, we feel, because actually it turns out that HRES is slightly more accurate on these initializations. So our results are going to look slightly worse. It's gonna, I mean, comparatively, they're better than HRES's. But they'll, when you look at the relative difference, we'll see a slight decrement in our relative difference in a second because HRES is actually slightly more accurate at these initializations. Similarly, we only evaluate on targets at the 6 and 18 validity times for the same reason. We only want to eva evaluate on validity times that are informed by the same, the, the same amount of look ahead in the assimilation window. Okay, so here's the results. So this is a kind of just a, 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 a um, example of what the results uh, of, of how we're going to, you know, kind of do our analysis. So what I've got here uh, is three curves that show the skill based on RMSC, the skill score, which is the relative RMSC, and then we do an ACC skill as well. Um, the x-axis is the lead time, so out to 10 days at these 12-hour increments I noted. 
Uh, the y-axis is the skill or the skill score. The black curves are always HRES, and the blue curves are always graph cast. For when you, RMSC is an error score, so that's lower numbers are better. Uh, ACC, it, it, higher numbers are better. Um, so that's how you can interpret this. And what you can see is that if you just look at the sort of RMSC between uh, HRES and graph cast, graph cast is always more accurate than HRES on the full 10 day window. And this vertical dashed line is just that point that this is the last point that we were using HRES is zero, uh, 06 and 18 initializations. And you can see this, this is what I was talking about. There's a little jump because basically HRES gets a little bit better on its zero and 12 uh, initializations. And we're still using the zero, the six, 18 initializations for GraphCast here. But anyway, the skill score is a kind of key thing you want to look at here. It's basically showing that GraphCast is better or, you know, lower is better. We're, we're up, you know, 10% to maybe 8% over time better than HRES. This is how we summarize our results. So what we do is we say, um, we, we take, take the skill scores, RMSC skill scores, and we try to make a kind of analog of the ECMWF scorecard that they use to, to compare their uh, models, their HRES models, different models against each other. So here, blue indicates a better skill score, red indicates a, a better skill score for GraphCast, red indicates a better skill score for HRES. And you can see on these plots, so this again, on the x-axis is lead time, on the y-axis now is the vertical pressure level. Um, and each of one of these large sort of rectangular boxes is a single variable. And you can see that on all variables, except for, um, except for the, uh, sorry, all fields, except for the 50 hectopascal pressure level, which it turns out is in the stratosphere, which we now have realized and done some post analysis to find that we're seeing a lot more error in just the stratosphere. And we think that this might actually, might not actually be a problem with our model, but maybe more with the stratosphere data. Um, basically our model graph cast is always has better skill score, except at the highest or the, the very highest, like, like upper, the highest uh, ver vertical levels in the atmosphere. Um, and then these are some of the surface levels. And I think, except for surface temperature, on um, the first 12 hour lead time, I think we're always better than HRES. So we're, we're better than HRES on 90.3% of these 1300 targets. Um, this I'll just go through quick. Um, we, we also outperform all previous ML baseline. So the best of them was is this Huawei uh, Pangu weather paper. Um, we took all the targets that they reported and we beat and GraphCast outperforms them on 99% of those targets. These are some examples, geopotential, specific humidity, surface temperature. Um, and one more thing I wanted to show is um, autoregressive, the effect of autoregressive training. So I made a big deal earlier about how we like train the model with not just one step, but 12 autoregressive steps. And you can see this is why. So this is one of the decisions and choices we made as we were doing our model development. Um, here, what you're seeing, and I'll just call your attention to the bottom row, it's the skill score. Um, the, uh, the, the, these are skill scores with respect to the gra GraphCast 12 AR is like the model I just showed you. That's the model that's training on 12 autoregressive steps. That's like our sort of main model. These are the skill scores of other models. The lighter blue curves are skill scores of other models that have been trained with fewer and fewer autoregressive steps. So instead of training all the way up to 12 autoregressive steps, we train them with, like, say, four autoregressive steps. And you can see that there's a pretty systematic pattern here where the across lead time, the relative performance is not as good. So like we get better and better if we train on more and more autoregressive steps. And we probably get even better if we train on longer ones on, on more, but um, it's, we, we felt this was sort of good enough. Like we kind of, we're beating HRS, we're kind of happy. Um, there's also, I'm not gonna get into this, but we can discuss this if anyone's interested. Um, we get, we do notice that the model blurs that we, we see like spatial blurring, which we can talk about, um, which is to be expected when you have an RMSC training objective. Um, and part of, we also kind of didn't want to, like probably what's sort of happening here is you get better and better HRs, you're also basically getting blurrier and blurrier forecasts, which is a sort of known way to kind of gain the RMSC made metric. So again, we can talk about that if anyone's interested, but we, we felt that 12 was sort of good, but it just shows the autoregressive training is having a really big impact. Um, and the last thing I'll show from the results and then I'll wrap up, um, here's some, uh, I just put huge pictures of <laughs> um, specific humidity, which is one of the highest resolution of our fields. Um, this is specific uh, humidity. Oops, I don't know which level this is. I think it might be 700 hectopascals, but I don't think I've labeled it here. Sorry. Um, but this is like, uh, this was from 2018 and November 21st, and this is the 12th uh, initialization. This is four days later at the same time. This is uh, four days further at the same time. So you can see that you've got high resolution detail in the, uh, oh, the, actually, I'm sorry. This, I think this is two, the two, two days into the forecast six days into the forecast and 10 days into the forecast. Um, 
you can still see you ha have a lot of high resolution detail. Um, I can get into some of the details of this. We, we've done a lot of analysis now on uh, the spectral, this, the spectrum and the uh, all kinds of, uh, we, we've done all kinds of optimal blurring comparisons to make sure that we're like not giving HRES an unfair disadvantage. Um, our results still hold up just fine, but you can see that we do preserve a lot of the structure um, uh, even out to 10 days. At, at some of the, at some of the in, in a specific community, which I think have the highest um, frequency uh, structure. Cool. So the last thing I'll just do is some limitations, and I'll switch to questions, um, and I'll go through these real quick. So one big limitation: we're lower resolution than HRES. HRES is 0.1 degree horizontal. We're quarter degree horizontal. Um, this choice was mostly due to error five being quarter degree resolution, um, and that it would be about six times more memory of operating at 0.1 degree. Our forecast, the 10-day forecast, is already 35 gigabytes. Multiply that by six, you're getting, you're, you're knocking on the door of like 200 gigabytes. Um, that starts to really stress even the, the highest end um, hardware right now. And, and, and you know, we're not, we're not running this on like specialized hardware. This is just sort of deep learning hardware. RMS training objective, as I just mentioned, encourages spatial blurring. Um, so in, in the way you think about this is because of the predictive uncertainty, GraphCast expresses uncertainty by blurring. There's a really nice ECMWF um, uh, blog uh, blog post note on this earlier this year, I think January, and they, they're introducing this fractional skill score metric. I definitely recommend, I should put the link here. I recommend you check it out if you're interested. Um, we might be able to uh, sort of adapt to this, overcome it using perturbed ensembles, probabilistic predictions, which would allow it to express its uncertainty in different ways and then it would preserve the high frequency structure. Um, I haven't shown any performance on downstream applications. We're doing this stuff. Um, we actually have pretty nice results um, that I'm not, uh, we're not quite ready to show on cyclone tracking atmospheric rivers and extreme heat forecasting, um, but stay tuned. Uh, we want to, we haven't been, we, we, there's no, these are sort of next steps. Like why can't we make longer range forecasts? We can, like the data is there. Um, it's just, again, something that was just not on our, hasn't been on our roadmap yet, but we're sort of interested in this. Um, and then using real observations. So this is a really obvious one. Like we are always using a simulated observation analysis. Why not use real observations as well? Um, uh, there's obviously the, some of the reasons are that it's it's a completely different, it's not like a dense sort of you know uh, standardized data format it's sort of sparse and also it's hard to get observations that change over time but this could be very helpful for uh, ML based forecasting. Okay, so then my conclusions: um, ML based weather prediction is now competitive with how operational systems um, accurate and efficient as compared to HRES. We're outperforming all the ML baselines we've seen so far, and um, Going back to my initial points about like the the advantages that we're hoping to to, to um, offer with ML, um, we can capitalize on rich historical observations using these learned simulation methods, um, and this does avoid the need for costly manual design of equations and solvers. Like I, I don't know much about atmospheric rivers, but like that because I can get the data and I know about machine learning, I can still build these models. Uh, and that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Peter. That was fascinating. Really interesting talk. Great level of, of detail as well as giving that fantastic overview there. Um, we've got some questions in. Thanks for asking that one already. Um, I'm going to be cheeky and jump in with one of my own first day. Um, so you're, you're, you're training it and 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 testing it against the era five data. So so have you are you basically kind of saying you've got that you've there's a reliance upon there being good quality NWP anyway. And to improve this, you're going to need improvements in the NWP. So how do you see that kind of going forward? That kind of yeah, that's a really good question. I mean the um yeah so I don't mean to say this is like I, I definitely don't want to give the impression this is oh oh you know we don't need NWP anymore. In fact I really I actually really like this. I, I really like that there's this sort of um it, in some sense it's like changing the dependence on NWP, right? It's saying we need NWP, especially for the data assimilation, but maybe not so much more for the forecasting quite as much. Um, that said, um, now we're using ERA-5. We could, I, I think, at first I thought you were going to say, like, why didn't we train on HRES? Like, we're definitely thinking about this. Um, the uh, uh, HRES, again, is because it's constantly being upgraded. Like, it's not really like one data set. So it's like, it's like it's not clear. And actually, before 2016, it wasn't even, it, it wasn't even apt. 0.1 degree resolution, but um, so yeah, the one question that does get raised though is can you use these types of MLWP models for data simulation um, or could you start to bootstrap off models and get like better observations that way? We haven't really thought much about this. Um, it's just something that we kind of like, you know, we like think about and talk about over beers or whatever. Um, but um, 
yeah and then i think the last point i made about using raw observations like there you know some some approaches might try to just sort of eschew the need for uh, data assimilation entirely by just doing like observation to observation prediction um, but again observations are hard to get uh, for many reasons and harder to use so um, this i think is the kind of thing that will probably take time to kind of um, work out w one thing i'll just sort of add to what i kind of hope is that as these ml based approaches advance i hope that it um puts more emphasis like maybe if we don't need you know um to spend it you know as much sort of invest as much in our forecasts because we have the ml systems maybe we can invest more in observations so i'm kind of hoping that we get even better you know meteorological observations because that should just feed the ml models um but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Great, no, thanks very much. I'm gonna run through the, some of the questions online then. So you mentioned, um, well, it says, can it be approached to seasonal forecasting? I think you suggested that it could. And Oh yeah, like there's no reason that we can't do that um, in principle. I mean, it's something to test and see, you know, sort of seasonal, sub-seasonal. So I think like right now, our, um, uh, ECMWS ENS has their extended range forecast, which is 45 days. Um, yeah, like I think, I think it's just, it's something to try. You know, there's questions about the sort of, um, you know, the the off of uh, of the actual weather dynamics and whether like, you know, how, how precise would the observations have to be to actually like get much benefit in the longer term. But again, just from a, you know, just to answer the question, there's no principal reason why we can't predict. I mean, we can, we, our model can roll out like a year forecast if we want. We haven't really done this just because we haven't been evaluating it, but we could. Okay. So there's a couple around the kind of laws of do, um, how well it obeys the laws of physics, or I mean, is it constrained to conserve things like total water? And yeah, this is a great question. I mean, it's incentivized to through its training, um, but there's no guarantees. Um, we haven't looked at this. This is something. I mean, I'd, be, I'd love to talk about this more. If you have ideas about like key things that you key conserved quantities you'd want to measure and things like that, I'd be really interested in that. I think for for weather, I think it's a little bit less. Like for some of these idealized, like you know turbulent systems and things like it's very clear there's certain things that need that you can measure very carefully but here you've got like you know you've got radiative radiative forcing and all this kind of stuff so there's like a lot of there's a lot of you know it, there's lots of this not conserved or that's like not easy to measure and to know whether it's conserved but if you have ideas what to do on all ears that'd be great great thanks and there's one um just about what the highest altitude the model went to and then a kind of related one just to say that you showed it outperformed um, its RMSC skill until it tried to predict targets in the higher atmosphere. And is there specific reasons for this yeah, outside we, of the weighted loss? Um, the model, we actually, the model, the high, the, the uh, highest field is actually at one hectopascal, which I, I don't even know where that is. But what I showed, what we evaluated on at the, the, the highest was 50 hectopascals, which like the tropopause, which separates the troposphere from the stratosphere is not uniform over the globe, but it's about at, my understanding is about at 100, roughly 100 to 50, typically hectopascals. So um, I don't, I don't even know what the, you, you probably know better than me how many kilometers that is. But basically, like I, I just think in sort of pressure levels. But I know that the stratosphere is basically that, like what we're evaluating, the stratosphere is a very top, is a very top. One thing I should also add, I didn't mention this before. We, um, oh no, I did. Sorry, I did mention this before. Yeah, we we, we downweight the loss um, as a function of vertical altitude. So up in these very, very highest elevations, there's almost, there's like less than a, a percent of the total loss is being applied to this. So the model really is not being incentivized at all to make good predictions at one hectopascal. Um, just because I don't think people don't, you know, easy to know that it doesn't even evaluate this. Um, they don't show this in their scorecard. It doesn't seem like anything that people really think about or informs okay. whether that. Thanks. Um... There's, and there's one about you mentioned the blurring, and that sounds like there's quite a lot of interest in that aspect. Does 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 that tendency for blurring inhibit forecasting of rapidly evolving smaller scale cyclones, for example, that may be the most damaging? And I'd kind of want to follow up on that to say, are there other kind of techniques you could introduce to help with generating the types of um, fine level structure you'd imagine? You'd yeah, expect? So it's, this is a great question, right? So. Okay, so first of all, I will I will say that I think my understanding is cyclones usually ten day cyclone forecasts aren't as much of a thing because cyclones often don't even last for ten days. Um, but like I think you know on the five day sort of horizon, I think it's so. Remember, we do we do see much less. We, we like like the blurring takes you know it, it, it grows over time. So in shorter range, we're going to see less. Um, but there's like there's a really important question here, which is what is it better to have a blurry forecast that is better RMSE or a 
sharp forecast that's kind of wrong. And I think I think the answer that perturbed ensembles give is, well, it's better to actually have a distribution of sharp forecasts where some of them are wrong, but some of them are right. And I think that's like a really good answer, right? That's like, that's like if you really want to model the sort of posterior of the future given the present, that's kind of the best, this is like the best way we have to do it numerically. Um, but I think there, there's, this sort of gets into another question of like, yeah, like what do you, how downstream should we be thinking about our applications? Like maybe we should be optimizing our model to support the downstream application directly. So maybe you start with your graph cast and then you actually either append on another machine learning model at the end or even just fine tune the graph cast itself so that it, it supports the task that you care about. So I'm not, I'm not an expert in cyclones and I don't actually know that much about how the uh, smaller scale high resolution uh, uh, structure how important it is or what role it plays. But I'd be really, I'd be really excited to chat more about this and just to, to understand more about this problem because maybe there are ways that we can either, without having to sort of generally improve the resolution or the, the, the frequency distribution of graph cast, we could still support these, these um, use cases. Um, and I think maybe just to add one more point about like other other techniques. Sure, like I think that you could, um, you could do things like try to penalize, lose it, like the high frequencies higher, so that if you lose high frequencies, you eat that penalty. But I really think the appropriate approach is to use probabilistic methods so that um, you can give the sharp forecasts and get credit if any, if, if, if the distribution of those sharp forecasts is, um, is, is faithful to what it has high likelihood, you know, provides high likelihood for the actual observations. Great, thank you very much. Um, a couple more questions. So. Can you compare graphcast to the same ground truth as HRES, or is it um, the resolution yeah, statement? Yeah, so, I mean, well, we have to down we have to downsample uh, uh, HRES to make that comparison, or we'd have to learn an upsampler for graphcast. Now, we've done sort of all of these things in preliminary work. Um, if you tr take the graphcast, just train an error five, it's it's pretty good. It's not like it's you, you know you see a definite decrement in like sort of like. The, the, the performance appears like if you basically compare graph cast against HRES ground truth and HRES against HRES ground truth, you're going to see the relative improvement of graph cast over HRES slip a lot. Like you're going to see in many cases, in many like fields and levels, I think especially in the short term, you're going to see graph cast be worse than HRES. But what you can do is fine tune graph cast to HRES so that you're basically, again, after you've kind of pre trained it on RFI, you've now post, you know, later tra trained it to try to. Do better on HRES, and that improves things a lot. Um, so again, preliminary sort of uh, work we're starting to explore this, and it looks like um, well, I, I, I can't really say anything too firm about whether it's going to the the, the performance is going to be the same because we haven't. This is sort of very preliminary, but um, uh, I, I don't think this is going to be a big issue, and it, it, it sort of should be kind of unsurprising because Era Five is just based on a slightly older HRES uh, NWP. So. Um, um, and one about um, touch on why precip isn't one of your variables. Is that just because yeah. not very good in era five? So, my understanding, I'm not an expert in this. My understanding is that the ECMWF precipitation data. So you should remember that about half of our team or a, a large fraction of our team were involved in um, DeepMind's previous precipitation now casting work that was a, uh, with the UK Met office and was a nature paper, I think two years ago or so. Um, so these people are experts on precipitation. I am not an expert. <laughs> um, the general consensus, I think, is that the and among our group and I think among uh, other folks is that the ECMWF precipitation analysis is not that good. Like ECM folks at ECMWF have sort of you know indicated like you know this is the best you can sort of do, but this is you know so precipitation I think is generally regarded as being disproportionately like kind of poor um, in in era five and in HRES. Um, yeah, I think that was the main, I mean, it is funny, we, we modeled it, we, we weren't modeling it at one point, and we decided to just throw it into the model, and then we really have done almost no evaluation on it, um, I think, partly just for time, I mean, we, we could, but it's sort of just like, what, are, we're, we just don't, even, we don't really expect, we don't, we're not really sure, I mean, we probably should, but I, I'm not sure what conclusion we would draw from this, because even if it looks good, we don't really believe it, if it doesn't, looks bad, we don't really care. Um, yeah. Okay. Can you, um, this is one of my thought for me. Is could you kind of summarize how what what it is about the graph cast structure that's getting more from the from the data than you can get from NWP or from those other approaches to machine learning approaches? Is it integrating um, that coarser spatial, large, long distance stuff with the high resolution? So we've done very very 
um, preliminary work to, to study the, um, the receptive, like, like sort of the effective receptive fields of like basically like what part of the globe, what, what spatial, like if you're trying to make a prediction at a particular point, what part of the globe around you is informing that? Um, so that's, that's sort of one kind of gets at your question. And when we do find is that it's first of all sort of asymmetric, it's kind of tilted toward like in the, in the opposite degree of the wind. So like, you know, the advection convection is sort of driving it, right? It's like the weather from over there is being, you know, convected over to here. So, we, and we kind of see the model seems to know that. Um, it's hard to say, I guess what I would say is just that when you look at the equations of many of these fluid solvers, which we've sort of worked with quite a bit over the years, we just can't, we, 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 we know that the neural networks have higher expressive capacity. Like these are not, these equations are sophisticated, but they are not, the, their neural network learned functions are far more sophisticated. Like they, they have their expressive capacity to learn complex functions is far greater. And at the end of the day, these NWP methods are making errors. Like the weather, they're not modeling weather perfectly. They're generating, you know, they're, they're making errors. And, that's, and some of that error is not strictly due to uncertainty in the initial conditions. Um, uh, so it, it must be that, um, the, that these models are not, I mean, and we kind of know we need like cloud res resolving models and things like this. And we're, you know, at, at, at you know, at HRES is native resolution at quarter at, at 0.1 degree. It's still orders of magnitude off what the physics tells us we need to get, to get it really right. Um, so I think that's kind of the end. So I think it's just that the um, the physical parameters, like you know, so you've got your you know you've got your um, dynamical core and you've got your physical parameterization, and the physical param param parameterization is just not correcting the errors introduced by the granularity of the dynamical core enough. They're great. I mean, again, weather forecasting is it really is. I mean, it, among the fields we've looked at, it is really a, a really really good example of how well you know the science and engineering has come together to make like really re incredibly accurate forecasts. But still, the weather is even more complicated than that. Great. And then the final one um, from somebody, will, will the data be publicly available? And I'd also add, yeah, any, any thoughts yeah, on whether the code is likely to be available? Yeah, yeah. So that's our plan. So basically, okay, so for, for data, for the forecasts, we're sort of doing a little bit of staged rollout right now. We're, we're kind of distributing, you know, we're, we're kind of, um, well, well, now actually uh, DeepMind and, and part of Brain, uh, part of Google, Google Brain have merged, I don't know if you've, if you've heard, but um, until then, we, you know, DeepMind had operated somewhat sort of independently from Google in, in certain ways. So right now what we're doing is just rolling out, uh, we're sort of like um, rolling out, so to speak, our forecasts to uh, Google groups right now to kind of get feedback and also uh, to ECMWF increasingly now. Um, I think we, our plan is to just put all of the forecasts um, like uh, online soon, but we've, in the, since the archive paper was published, we um, have done a, a huge amount of verification analysis. We spent like months, we basically in a, in a journal paper we just submitted, we have about hundred pages of appendix um, of like basically just further verification. And we found a lot of like, this is kind of what also led us to do this, um, to, to cutting in half the number of targets and like changing the initialization, how to evaluate, because we realized like we were trying to be really conservative. So basically we just had felt, we, look, we want to kind of really understand what's going on in their forecast first and make sure that we're like, you know, putting like, like what we put out, we kind of like understand. But yeah, the plan hopefully is within, I, I would hope within like a few months, month or a few months maybe. Um, but keep, if you bought, the more you bother me, if you send me emails, the more, I'll, the, the more I'll probably push to try to do it. It's just, it, it's, yeah. Um, That's great. Well, just, yeah, so I've wrapped that up to say thanks again. That's a fantastic talk, really fascinating. And um, yes, yeah, great to have you with us. And thanks for your time. Um, just to summarize for, for the audience thanks for attending um again please subscribe to the youtube channel which will put the link back in and note the the NERC digital environment conference please have a look the next webinar is going to be held on the 2nd of june at 11 o'clock again presented by tom august of uk ceh always gives you a fantastic and interesting talk with loads of great uh, great content and images um he's talking about ai for on the ground biodiversity monitoring um so please make a note in your diaries and book the place on there with the link. Um, with that, thanks very much for attending the session and thanks again to the speaker.